I'd like to talk about the anterolateral ligament and give some background and uh, my early reconstruction experience in my practice with ALL. Here are my disclosures. So the anterolateral ligament, ALL, was this a new discovery as the New York Times reported uh, back in November uh, 2013. Uh, caught some of us off guard about this new ligament that uh, we supposedly knew about but didn't. And here was the article from the Journal of Anatomy. This is the lead author, Stephen Kleiss from Belgium and his co-authors describing the anatomy of the anterolateral ligament of the knee. So, what is the anterolateral ligament? This is one of Stephen's pictures that he loaned me, and you can see here, outlined in yellow, this band of tissue that begins near the lateral pocondyle and extends um, anterior to the lateral carotid ligament, just below it, inserting uh, on the tibia. So, I think Kleiss's work was very important because it brought back into focus the lateral extraticular study that we need to look at. Um, with knee anatomy, in particular with knee injury in terms of anterocruciate ligament injuries. There's been many descriptions of a similar ligament in the past that has been confusing. And I think we need to go back to history. There are some important contributors that we need to recognize. First of all would be uh, Sagan in 1879 who described this uh, same probable ligament um, before x-ray in fact. And then Dr. Houston uh, in 1976 talked about the lateral capsule ligament prior to MRI and we'll talk about his work as well. So this is Sagan's original treatise and described uh, this band where there was a fracture off the lateral tibia. Again, this was pre-X-ray. And this is the so-called Sagan fracture that has his name, uh, was, which is seen uh, when it is present with an anterior cruciate ligament tear and most likely represents actually an avulsion of the ALL off the tibia. So Sagan described this pearly resistant fibrous band of tissue. Woods came along in 1979 and published on what he termed the lateral capsular sign, representing an avulsion of the meniscal tibial portion of what was termed the middle third lateral capsular ligament. And they noted its association with an anterior cruciate ligament tear, and that's how the lateral capsular sign, or Sagan fracture, became pathomonic with an anterior cruciate ligament tear. And Stephen Kleiss, in his work, recently um, did a clinical study. They looked at um, patients that had a Sagan fracture on MRI, and then he compared this to dissecting a native ALL and he did measurements and it turned out that the insertion attachment of the tibia of the native ALL matched exactly where the fracture on MRI in those clinical cases. So that would be confirmatory that the Sagan fracture is actually an avulsion of the ALL off the tibia. So how about Dr. Houston in 1976 wrote that the middle third of the lateral capsular ligament attaches proximally to the lateral pocondyle of the femur and distally at the tibial joint margin which is very similar to what doc, which Dr. Stephen Kleist described as well. And in this landmark article in JBGS where he presented his classification of knee ligament instabilities, I think it's important in part two when he talked about the lateral compartment. He described anterolateral rotatory instability caused by a tear of the middle one-third of the lateral capsular ligament, but it may be accentuated by other tears, particularly a tear of the ACL. So Dr. Houston, back in 1976, put together the relationship of lateral capsular injury with ACL tears even back then. So this is a picture of, of, from Dr. Houston's book and what uh, we did. I trained with Dr. Houston and we did extra articular stabilization and part of that procedure was we placated the middle third lateral capsular ligament as you can see on the left. And then this is Kleiss's uh, diagrammatic picture of the ALL that he describes. You can see they're very similar orientation. So what Stephen Kleist did is he looked at full leg cadavers with uh, praxim navigation for digitalization, looking at the 3D movements of the tibia versus the femur to look at the biomechanics of the ALL. And this was one of his critically important slides that he found um, in a sequence, a cutting sequence. So what he did is he cut the uh, native ACL first with the antimedial bundle, as you can see here in light purple, and checked the pivot shift. And in many cases, it was just one plus. Then he added uh, cutting the PL bundle and got a two plus pivot shift uh, in a couple of those uh, cadavers. But then when he cut the ALL in addition to the complete ACL tear, he had the markedly positive three plus pivot shift. So it looked like the ALL was very contributory to this very big pivot shift. And so he felt that the ALL based on his work was an important internal rot rotatory stabilizer primarily between 30 and 90 degrees of knee flexion, but the anterior cruciate ligament was not. Sectioning the ALL in some cases led even to a one plus pivot shift when the ACL was intact. And often, as he showed on that last slide, cutting the ACL sometimes only had a one plus pivot. It's when the ALL was cut with the ACL that he saw the three plus pivot shift. Therefore, this relationship of the ACL and the ALL when you have that markedly positive pivot shift. 
A new study at the University of Washington, uh, published here in 2015 by Parsons, uh, talked about the biomechanics of the ALL as well, and their uh, results of their work was that they felt the ALL resisted internal rotation with the knee flex greater than 35 degrees, but the ALL did not resist the anterior drawer at all. So that the ACL was the primary stabilizer for anterior drawer and for internal rotation less than 35 degrees. So they found what Stephen Kleist found also, the importance of the ALL uh, past 30 degrees for internal rotation stability. I think it's important to look at the knee uh, schematically in this way, where when we're trying to control rotational instability of the pivot shift for our patients and athletes to return to play, if we place a central ACL across the knee, even more anatomically, laterally on the wall of the femur, as we are doing nowadays, still it's tough to control that rotational moment. But if you add the ALL on the lateral side, as seen here in red, I think you can appreciate the fact that this should have a definite benefit on rotational stability of the knee. So when you have this type of pivot shift, this big three plus clunk right there, I think these are the cases now that, that I'm interested in that we need to think about maybe doing more than just the ACL reconstruction. How these patients present in terms of examination, many patients, as you know, with ACL tears will have lateral tenderness, um, and, and I think that correlates with the middle third capsule area. You can see the ALL on MRI. Uh, sometimes it's tough, but it's there. Uh, some are using ultrasound, which I have not had experience with so far, but that may be also helpful to assess the integrity of the ALL. So the big question is, who needs reconstruction? We know that most patients do very well with a primary ACL reconstruction. I think that the ALL is injured always to some extent when one tears an ACL, but in most of these patients, when they come to see us, frequently they're painful and swollen. Many times they'll be put in a brace, they're put on crutches, we do what we call prehab to get them ready for surgery. They go through physical therapy. And I think that initial protective phase allows for some healing of the ALL as a capsule ligament. I think it can heal some. And so in that case, uh, we don't have to do any type of ALL reconstruction when they have their anterior cruciate ligament reconstructed. But for me, there are four points that I'm thinking about when I'm worried about my stability with the ACL reconstruction and whether I need to do an ALL as well. And the big one for me is graft re-tears. I, st I still believe this is an issue in 2015. Even though we have better anatomic ACL reconstruction uh, procedures now, um, we're seeing graft re-tears at an alarming rate, especially in young athletes under the age of 25, and we need to do better. I did do double bundle for a few years. and did quite a few of them, but for me, it did not improve the re-tear rate. Uh, the feeling was with double bundle, adding the peel bundle, that we'd get better rotational control. Again, being more centrally located, I just don't think it was enough. Um, ACL revisions are still a problem. Uh, the best revision is never as good as a primary, and so I think we can maybe uh, make a case for doing LA, ALL there to help optimize uh, our outcomes with revisions. And again, we still haven't solved the problem of the development of later osteoarthritis in patients who have ACL reconstructions, and maybe if we restore the lateral side ALL at the time of an ACL reconstruction, maybe we're going to better kinematically stabilize that joint and perhaps help reduce that risk of OA. So for me, what are my indications for ALL reconstruction now? In a primary ACL reconstruction situation, I'm particularly worried about the patients, the athletes who have that increased joint laxity tendency and have that really positive pivot shift because I believe those patients are at an increased risk for re-tears. Specifically, in the literature, it's been shown if a patient has excessive hyperextension greater than 10 degrees, they're more likely to have problems with uh, residual laxity uh, of ACL reconstruction. Also, if they have excessive laxity in their normal knee, more than 7.5 millimeters, that's a concern, a red flag that that patient is hyperlax and may have problems. Or what we see sometimes termed physiologic posterolateral rotatory laxity, frequently in females, they have a posterolateral drawer at 30 degrees of flexion or a positive dial. Those patients, are, I think, are a particular risk. And for me, it's usually the lax female that I see these characteristics of hyperextension and some physiologic posterior laxity. And so in a primary instance of those patients, I am adding an ALL now to my ACL reconstruction. So in addition to the hyperlax uh, female patient, which is a uh, prominence uh, in my practice, uh, also if they have a primary Sagan fracture, I think that's a classic case. We know that the ALL has been torn uh, to reconstruct in a chronic situation, or if they have an accentuated lateral femoral sulcus on a lateral x-ray, where we can see that impaction injury to the lateral femur. I think those are significant ACL injuries that may need the ALL as well. Again, I mentioned revisions. In my practice right now, I am doing an ALL with all my revisions. We know that revisions don't do as well. They have a higher failure rate than primaries. 
They often have that very positive pivot shift because they've had previous surgery, part of their meniscus may have been removed already, they have lack secondary restraints, so they just tend inherently to be more unstable. So I think the ALL may help there minimize the chance that they'll re-injure after a revision. Also, I have one case that I've done with a vertical intact ACL graft where they had the trace pivot glide, one plus pivot shift. Uh, instead of doing a revision ACL reconstruction, I added the ALL instead, and so far that patient has done well with that approach. So this is my early clinical experience from 2014 that I put together for this talk. These are patients with greater than three month follow-up, obviously very short. I wanted to do the same technique. Um, so in this uh, cohort, I have 11 that were revision ACL cases that I did an ALL with. Nine were primary ACL cases, and I had the one case of the pivot glide with an intact vertical graft that I mentioned. I elected to use allograft. Um, I'm comfortable with allograft tissue in an extra articular location. I wanted to standardize this. The width of the grafts were six millimeters. But importantly, this cohort of patients that I added an ALL reconstruction to my ACL reconstruction represented only 15% of my ACL cases over a nine month period. So about 15% of the time in my practice will I do an ALL. So my clinical experience so far, primary cases, they were all female. Looking back at the records, the average hyperextension based on looking at their uninjured knee was 12 degrees. 80% of these patients were injured playing basketball. Uh, again, all female when I did the primary ALL with my ACL reconstruction. So what about the graft that we use? We need to reproduce the anatomy. So what are the graft characteristics? This has been summary, it's a summary slide from these authors who looked at the anatomy. The length of the ALL is probably in the range of 36 to 40 millimeters. It's width, six to eight millimeters, not very th thick. It's only one to two millimeters. It's a small capsular ligament. Femoral attachment is five to eight millimeters. The tibial attachment is broader at 11 to 12 millimeters. So what grafts can you use? I mentioned I used allograft in my patients so far. I think a gracilis autograft is an excellent choice. Perhaps an internal brace may be also uh, an option here. The newest allograft option that I like is a pre-sutured lateral ankle tendon that Arthrex has available. It's cheaper than other allografts. It's pre-stitched on one end, and it's really a, a nice graft. You don't need a long graft, and this ankle lateral tendon graft really works very well for the ALL. In terms of graft placement, again, summarizing the work that's been done in the literature, the femur is the questionable area. I like to go just anterior and distal to the lateral condyle. Um, uh, most authors feel that is near the attachment point for the AOL. Some feel it's proximal and posterior, but I like anterior and distal because it also is, uh, I think, more protective for the lateral car ligament. You certainly do not want to uh, violate uh, the uh, lateral car ligament when you do your ALL reconstruction. The tibia is more straightforward. It's halfway from the uh, center of Gertie's tubercle to the center of fibular head, about 20 millimeters or so from each, halfway, about a centimeter below the tibial plateau. That's where I'm going to make my anchor point on the tibial side. X-ray you can use. Uh, in the first ones I did, I did use the image in the operating room. Halito published a study in AJSM last October looking at X-ray measurements uh, seen here, uh, looking at an AP projection and trying to plot where the AL uh, uh, was attached so you could use X-ray. And these are the numbers uh, from uh, their study looking at AP and lateral views as to the location specifically of the ALL uh, as another way to help guide placement. So my technique, I wanted to be consistent, so I used allograft on all these patients. My fixation proximally, again, just anterior and, uh, and distal to the uh, epicondyle was with a 4.75 millimeter biocomposite swivel lock anchor for the graft here. Distally, I used the forked seven millimeter swivel lock, and I fix at 30 degrees of flexion, neutral rotation. I think it's critical that we do not over tighten uh, the AOL, so I fix them at 30 degrees and uh, they make sure that they have their, their motion on the table. Uh, and you can check the isometry of the graph before you make your uh, tibial socket, which will show you by placement of your guide pin. But I think it's critical not to over constrain the joint, especially you don't want to make the lateral compartment too tight and promote OA here, which was a problem in some older extra articular uh, IT band teen adhesive procedures that were done. Here's a video. This is a right knee here, markedly positive pivot shift. I've already done a patellar tendon autographed ACL reconstruction. Mark the lateral epicondyle. I make a small incision here. Usually you can feel the epicondyle pretty well. I try to begin just anterior and distal with my guide pin over ream. Here's the 4.75 mover swivel lock with that pre-sutured graft. I secure the tendon. Then you go underneath the IT band, tunnel down to the tibia. There's the joint line marked. So about a centimeter below, drill my guide pin here. This is where you can shuttle your graft now from the small femoral incision below, below the IT band and bring it out the tibial incision, as you'll see here. And then we can wrap the graft 
or suture around the pin and you can then put the knee through a range of motion and check your isometry. So if you don't like where that pin is, you can change it. So check it through a range of motion, make sure there's no pistoning, you're happy with it. This is the fork swivel lock, seven millimeter, and I make sure I have enough laxity to graft that I can insert it. Here's the final tension, looks good. And again, I fix them at 30 degrees. I do not change anything with my rehabilitation. I go with early motion. Uh, frequently, I will use a CPM machine. I let them weight bear when their quad is good. I treat them just like an isolated ACL reconstruction. So in my early clinical results of the patients that I mentioned uh, that I've done this on so far, everybody has full extension. I've had no problems either with flexion. The primary cases that I did, which averaged 12 millimeters of hyperextension preoperatively on their uninjured knee, on the operated side, they were decreased to three degrees only. Here's a case that I did. You can see kind of a little bit of the prominence on the lateral side. Um, even after several months, you can, they can feel, the patients can feel the graft there, even though it is a small graft. So far, I have not had any problems with re-injury or recurrent pivot shift. These have been very stable knees for me so far. So in conclusion, I think the anatomic descriptions of the AOL vary because it is a capsular ligament. It's different, obviously, than the ACL or the lateral car ligament. It's within the capsule, best seen when you internally rotate. If you're dissecting and looking for it, it's in that lateral capsule region, as Dr. Houston uh, described initially. Um, it's important for internal rotation from 30 to 90 degrees with Dr. Stephen Kleiss uh, doing the great biomechanic work that he, did, that he has done to bring this to our attention. And it's probably a problem if you have that three plus pivot shift. If you have that patient with a markedly positive pivot, I think you might think about adding an ALL to your ACL reconstruction. Again, I'm looking for trying to get the criteria of who's at risk for re in that uh, group, and that's where I'm adding the ALL to hopefully give me better clinical outcomes. And from what I can see so far, following these patients of mine, again, short-term follow-up, but I think we're uh, seeing a lateral tenodesis effect. I'm decreasing their hyperextension. Uh, they're getting full extension, but not hyperextension, and that may be the key to uh, them avoiding re-injury to their knee. Thank you very much.